you'll hear a conversation between Alan and Gianna, the office counselor of a company. First, you have some time to read questions one to six. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions one to six. What's up, Gianna? You look like you're in bad shape. Yes, maybe I'll get sickly from the boss and finally catch up on some sleep. I've barely eaten and slept in days. Those are warning signs of occupational stress. How are things at work? Terrible. After all the layoffs lately, the workload is totally overwhelming for everyone that's left. So I spend every waking moment in the office. I'm kept busy all the time. So you need to take a few minutes break every so often to clear and refresh your mind. But my boss will complain I'm not hard working. She's so capricious that you can't predict her reaction sometimes. Maybe your boss just doesn't have a clue about how much you're really doing. Keep her updated on your achievements and projects. Also, insist that she prioritize everything so you can manage your time better. That's right. I suppose that would help me regain some sense of control. But I'm afraid that she'll take that as a sign of laziness and give me the axe. So take the initiative and hit the job hunting trail now. You'll be surprised at how many opportunities are out there. That's encouraging. Anyway, you should cheer up and get rid of the situation. You know, according to a survey, about forty percent of all people find their work very stressful, and twenty-five percent develop mental or physical diseases. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions seven to ten. So serious! I didn't know that. How do the problems start? You know, they start when conflicts at work induces stress. Your body reacts by flooding the bloodstream with hormones that tense up your muscles and increase your blood pressure. This is meant to save you in a fight or flight situation. But leads to a host of illnesses, ranging from insomnia and headaches to heart attacks, when it occurs regularly over an extended period of time. What should I do to prevent such things happening? Well, most occupational stress is attributed to a recognized lack of control. You should act in advance to relieve the problems. For example, you should actively pursue career opportunities. Rather than quietly worry about getting fired, of course you can't control everything, so you need to help your mind and body cope. Keep a journal to release your frustrations. Take short walks to calm down, or if necessary, simply take a mental health day. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a job interview. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Please sit down, Mr Wilson. My name's Jane Smith and I'm the personnel manager. Hello, how do you do? Now, this is just a short preliminary interview. I'd like to talk about your present job and what you've done up till now. Yes, of course. Well, could you tell me how long you've had your present position in Evening News? It is Evening News, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, I'm not sure. Let's see. I left university in 2002, is that right? Yes, uh, 2002. Then I was unemployed for about two months, and then I travelled round Britain for a few weeks. So it must be more than three years now, in fact. Um, yes. And have you any particular reason for wanting to change your job? I mean, why do you want to move? Well... I actually like my present job and still find it interesting. The salary is OK, so it's nothing to do with money, though you can always do with more. I suppose the thing is that I'm really very ambitious and keen to get promoted, so that's the real reason. You say you like your job. Can you tell me what aspect you like most? Oh dear, that's difficult. There are so many things. My colleagues are quite nice to go along with, so there's a good cooperative atmosphere, and compared to other presses, the working conditions are great. I mean, the office itself is good. Um, yes. And then there's the fact that, as a journalist, I regularly write articles about what is happening at home or in the world. So I have to make decisions. I must be responsible for what I have written. You know, that's what I really like most about the job. They give me lots of room for initiative. Yes. Well, we're looking for someone who isn't a clock watcher and who isn't too concerned about working fairly long hours. Oh, I don't mind that. I'm used to it. I often work irregular hours. I was very often made to work at night. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Hi John, are you nearly ready? Oh no, I don't think I'm going to make it tonight. Why? I've got this assignment to finish for tomorrow. Well, maybe I can help. What do you have to do? I have to do a short presentation on some household object. and I just can't think of anything. I have to talk about what it is and the parts in it. Well, why not make it simple? Why not describe a bottle or a can? Well, that's far too simple. OK, how about an aerosol can? Hmm, maybe. What labels can you put on it? First you'd have to draw an aerosol can. First thing you could label would be the hairspray or whatever was in the can. You'd just label that product, I suppose. Then you'd have to label the area above the product as the propellant. Is that the gas that presses down on the contents of the can, forcing it out through the dip tube? Yes, you've got it. OK. So far, so good. Now, at the top of the aerosol, there are quite a few things to label, so I'd have to write quite small. Unless you drew a couple of lines and showed an enlarged picture of that area. Yes, that would work. Then I could start labelling from the top to the bottom. The first thing on the enlargement would be the nozzle. The what? The nozzle. You know, N-O-Z-Z-L-E. Then the seal. Right. Then all I'd need is the spring. No, you'd need to label the inlet first. Then the final part would be the spring. Anyway, that's it. You've finished. We can go out now. Well, I have to type all that into the computer first and draw the can. Oh...
That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a tape recording of instructions and advice, which a woman called Martha has left for her friend John, who is coming to stay at her house and take care of it while she is away. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hello, John. Welcome to the house. I'm really pleased that you can be here to look after my house while I'm away. Here are some things you need to know about the house. Important stuff, like when the garbage is collected. In fact, let's start with the garbage, which is collected on Friday. Just write garbage on the calendar on the days they take it away. Put it out on Friday every week, that'll be Friday 22nd, Friday 29th and Friday 5th. It's a really good service. The trucks are quiet and the service is efficient. The bin will be put back outside the house empty. It's a good idea to put it away quickly. This street can be quite windy. I once watched my next door neighbour chase her bin the whole length of the street. Every time she nearly caught up with it, it got away again. The waste paper will be collected this Tuesday. That's Tuesday 19th. There's a plastic box full of paper in the front room. Please put it out on Tuesday. The truck will come during the day. If you don't mind collecting old newspapers and other paper and putting them in the box, I'll put it out when I come home. The paper people only come monthly. I have some things to give to charity in a box in the front room. Would you put it out on Monday the 25th, please? It's a box of old clothes and some bed linen which I've collected plus a few other bits and pieces. Be careful when you pick it up, because it's heavier than you might expect. The charity truck will come by during the day on the last Monday of the month. If you want to use the library, you'll find it on Darling Street. I've left my borrower's card near the telephone. It has a very good local reference section if you want to find out more about this city. I'm sorry to say we don't have a cleaner. Oh yes, filters. Please would you change the filters on the washing machine on the last day of the month, which is Sunday the 31st. We find that the machine works much better if we change the filters regularly. The gas company reads the meter outside the house, so don't worry about that. I think that's all the information about our calendar of events. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Well, John, I'm trying to think what else I should be telling you. As you know, I'm going to a conference in London. I hope to have a little time to look around. It's a great city. I do hope I manage to get to at least some of the theatres and museums. I'm looking forward to all the things I have to do at the conference too. I'm giving a paper on Tuesday the 26th and there are a couple of really exciting events planned later in the conference programme. I hope to meet up with an old teacher of mine at the conference. 
She taught English literature at my old high school, and we've kept in touch through letters over the years. She teaches now at the University of Durham, and I'm really looking forward to seeing her again. By the way, I expect you're hungry after your trip. I've left a meal in the refrigerator for you. I hope you like cheese and onion pie. Would you do me a favour, please? I haven't had time to cancel an appointment. It was made a long time ago, and I forgot about it until this morning. It's with my dentist for a checkup on Thursday, the twenty-eighth. Could you please call the dentist on eight one six two five two five and cancel the appointment for me? Thanks a lot, John. One last thing: when you leave the house, make sure the windows and doors are shut, and set the burglar alarm. The alarm code number is nine one two zero. Enter. Have fun. I'll see you when I get back. This is your friend Martha saying goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about dust storms. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-six. In the last lecture, we looked at the adverse effects of desert dust on global climate. Today, we're going to examine more closely what causes dust storms and what other effects they can have. As you know, dust storms have always been a feature of desert climates, but what we want to focus on today. Is the extent to which human activity is causing them, and it's this trend that I want to look at, because it has wide-ranging implications. So, what are these human activities? Well, there are two main types that affect the wind erosion process, and thus the frequency of dust storms. There are activities that break up naturally wind-resistant surfaces, such as off-road vehicle use and construction. And there are those that remove protective vegetation cover from soils, for example, mainly farming and drainage. In many cases, the two effects occur simultaneously, which adds to the problem. Let's look at some real examples and see what I'm talking about. Perhaps the best-known example of agricultural impact on desert dust is the creation of the USA's Dust Bowl in the 1930s. The dramatic rise in the number of dust storms during the latter part of that decade was the result of farmers mismanaging their land. In fact, choking dust storms became so commonplace that the decade became known as the Dirty Thirties. Researchers observed a similar but more prolonged increase in dustiness in West Africa between the 1960s and the 1980s, when the frequency of the storms rose to 80 a year. And the dust was so thick that visibility was reduced to a thousand meters. This was a hazard to pilots and road users. In places like Arizona, the most dangerous dust clouds are those generated by dry thunderstorms. Here, this type of storm is so common that the problem inspired officials to develop an alert system to warn people of oncoming thunderstorms. When this dust is deposited. It causes all sorts of problems for machine operators. It can penetrate the smallest nooks and crannies, and play havoc with the way things operate.
because most of the dust is made up of quartz, which is very hard. Another example. The concentration of dust originating from the Sahara has risen steadily since the mid-1960s. This increase in wind erosion has coincided with a prolonged drought, which has gripped the Sahara's southern fringe. Drought is commonly associated with an increase in dust-raising activity, but it's actually caused by low rainfall, which results in vegetation dying off. In the second part, the speaker talks about the drying up of the Aral Sea. Look at questions 37 to 40 and complete the flowchart. One of the foremost examples of modern human-induced environmental degradation is the drying up of the Aral Sea in Central Asia. Its ecological demise dates from the 1950s, when intensive irrigation began in the then Central Asian republics of the USSR. This produced a dramatic decline in the volume of water entering the sea from its two major tributaries. In 1960, the Aral Sea was the fourth largest lake in the world, but since that time it has lost two-thirds of its volume. Its surface area has halved, and its water level has dropped by more than 216 metres. A knock-on effect of this ecological disaster has been the release of significant new sources of wind-blown material as the water level has dropped. And the problems don't stop there. The salinity of the lake has increased, so that it is now virtually the same as seawater. This means that the material that is blown from the dry bed of the Aral Sea is highly saline. Scientists believe it is adversely affecting crops around the sea, because salts are toxic to plants. This shows that dust storms have numerous consequences beyond their effects on climate both for the workings of environmental systems and for people living in drylands. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.